And um, I suppose that <coughs> by the time winter sets in, it'll be cooler in here. <laughs> And then I got uh, some good chalk from the secretary. So. Mm -hmm. so we've got the chalk situation in hand. I also prepared, I also posted a PDF file in which um, I say uh, I, it includes the first homework assignment. Um, it's two problems. Tentatively, they're due next Wednesday. They won't be due before next Wednesday, but um, if next Monday there are, um, somebody wants to postpone the homework, well, now they can postpone it. These are two pedagogical problems. Um, one of them is very much like what I did in the early part of the lecture yesterday. Uh, yesterday, Monday. Um, I talked with one of the more senior graduate students, um, in fact the one who asked the question what kind of chocolate, um, when I said that I was going to give my chocolate questions. And um, I said to him, I wasn't sure whether the students thought that I was going too fast or that I was going too slowly. And he said to me, he was sure that I was going too fast. Now, I don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but the way to, does anybody want to offer a comment? Should I slow down? I see there are some nods, yes. Okay. I mean, I'd say, like, personally, um, like, I don't know, I mean, my, my take on it is, like, it seems like the pace is, I don't know, it's, it's all right, but um, maybe just focusing a little bit more on, like, conceptual stuff. Um, yeah, a little like, more on? Like, conceptual stuff. Because it seems like most of what we've been doing is just kind of, like, very, like, you know, nuts and bolts of, like, path integration and stuff like that. Um, and, I don't know, maybe just having a little bit more about talking you mean the overview why we're doing it yeah or it's not, I mean I, I guess like we kind of did that in like the first lecture and talked about you know, here's kind of why path integration happens and here's how we set up stuff but it seems like a lot of like I don't know last lecture and stuff was like just focusing on here's how to do this very specific like calculation and stuff like that but I don't know this is so, uh, what did you say about the last part? That, uh, for example, the case when I did the Q1 and Q2 integrals explicitly. Yeah, yeah. Which, which that was that helpful or not? Yeah, I think it was helpful, but um, yeah, I don't know. I guess just like balancing out like that sort of stuff with. Uh, that's just me. So you'd like more talk about the physics? Yeah, <coughs> that'd be nice. Right. Well, I mean, the situation is um, that, let's see, basically anything you want to Basically, anything you want to compute in, in quantum field theory, at least, can be written as a ratio of path integrals. Okay. And you then have two choices. You can either, if the coupling is weak, then what you can do is you can do perturbation theory. And that leads to things called Feynman diagrams. And uh, which Feynman diagrams you get depends upon what terms, what are the terms that are cubic and quartic or whatever in the, in the hydrogen of the action. 
the coupling's strong, you can't do perturbation theory. And um, you have to basically uh, approximate what, what, what people do is they discretize space time. And the first discretizations that were more or less successful were done by Kreutz back in, I think, 1980 or 82 or so. And he used a 10 by 10 by 10 by 10 lattice. So all of space time was this cube, hypercube, of 10 to the fourth points. But that's already 10 to the fourth points. And so he, he had to do a 10 to the fourth dimensional integral. And what he did was he used what's called the Monte Carlo technique. And the uh, computers got better. People could go to uh, 20 by 20 by 20 by 20. But notice when you go from 10 to 20, the number of points increases by 2 to 4, which is 16. So you know, 16 times more uh, to do. And um, so it's, anyway, that, that approach was, was called the lattice gauge theory because um, the strong couple theory, which you, know, which you couldn't do perturbation theory, was quantum chromodynamics. And um, so some success was, was, was achieved with these uh, computations. And um, these computations normally used um, not simply Kreutz's method, but the uh, a device introduced. Uh, Produced by Wilson, which simplified the path of the field. Simplified the path of the field. Instead of an integral over all of the gauge fields, dA i of xk, instead of integrating all of these, you integrated over uh, elements of a uh, group like SU2 or SU3. And this made this, the advantage of this was that it made the computation simpler and also preserved a certain symmetry or imposed a certain symmetry. Um, and the, the, the symmetry of the theory was, the actual field theory was a local symmetry uh, in which you could make independent unitary transformations three by three unitary transformations on fields at every point in space time. And in Wilson's ensembles, you could make unitary transformations on the uh, group elements at every, on every link between the points of space time. Um, anyway, I, I think that what I'm going to do, though, is um, I'd like to really understand these path integrals, and I think the best way to understand them is to do the mathematics correctly. And, um, but at the same time, I think you should read C's book. Um, it's, a, it's a marvelous book, and I posted the first chapters of it now on the website. How I'm able to do that is because I was in China for a couple months. Um, and uh, I'm sure various graphics students know how to do it when I come from China. Um, anyway, uh, so I, th I think I'm going to partly do, we, uh, the class I'm going to partly tell you things uh, out of um, Z's book, but I'm also going to tell you things out of chapter 16 of this book that I've just written. Um, and uh, because I think it introduces the, the, it does the details in a way that makes things, uh, I hope it makes things clearer. Um, so, 
Let me first, though, mention that uh, one of the corrections that I made in class to that chapter 16 was actually wrong. The equation in the text was right. And so the equation should be QC double dot of T is minus omega squared QC of T. I somehow thought it was an M here, but there's an M there that cancels, so that's, that's that. Um, Okay, let me, let me now uh, do what I think will be, will be somewhat clearer. I'm going to go through section 16.8, and chapter 16 is online, and I, I think this will be clearer. I actually wasn't intending to do this today, but... Um, and in fact, I wrote up other notes. But I then finally decided that it would be clearer if I think it would be clearer if I follow what's in chapter 16. So let me just refer you to 16.8. That's the section. So this is um, the idea is to compute the following p e to the minus beta h time, and we're going to use one of Feynman's uh, tricks uh, to do this. Um, in the notes, uh, in, the, in the text, I have, um, I've kept that factor n there, but one can just as well absorb it with the dqs because its role is really to normalize that. We then have an integral 0 to beta and if we're doing the harmonic oscillator, uh, and um, as I said, the, the when I originally wrote that chapter, I had this, I thought of n as a separate factor, but I think it's better to put it here, which is what z does. The Hamiltonian here is, of course, p squared over 2m plus a half omega squared, q squared, and we imagine that qp is i. And the complete set of states are q, q prime is q prime, q prime, p, p prime is p prime. These are eigenstates of q and p. Yeah. It's Amelia Square, right? And uh, Hamilton? Hamilton? Ah, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Or errors? All right. Um, Okay, so this, we could call this the Euclidean action, that's what people normally call it. And it's a half m q dot squared plus a half m omega squared q squared dt. So it's purely quadratic, and this means we can do this thing exactly. Um, and the way to do it exact, the, the easy way to do it exactly is to, and the way that in, in fact used for many sorts of problems in, in fact, in chronic problem dynamics as well, is to um, look for the classical solution. And so, what we do is we look at what this is, and this is d by d epsilon of an integral of zero to beta, a half m, q dot, 
plus epsilon h dot squared plus a half m omega squared. So in other words, I'm setting q equal to q classical plus epsilon h. What's h? h is just some function of time, an arbitrary function of time. And I'm taking the derivative at epsilon equal to zero. And what this gives you is, is zero to beta m q classical dot h dot plus m omega squared q classical h dt. You now integrate by parts and you get zero to beta minus m classical double dot plus m omega squared to classical all that times h. And we want this to be zero. And that gives us what's called Euclidean classical uh, equation of motion. And this is, so it's like the classical motion of the harmonic oscillator, but it's a different sign here. Um, this, this was done in gauge theory. Well, uh, the first time by a hook, and um, he, what he showed was that there was something that he called an instant time. He sent the paper of his red letters, and the editor said, well, we can't call it an instant time. It's going to be called a pseudoparticle. So we to change it to pseudoparticle. By the time the paper was published, though, everybody was calling it an instant time. Where pseudo particle, I think, appeared only in that his red letter that the that the referees insisted uh, on um, having a uh, bit of changes and changes. Okay. Um, another way of doing this, I was doing this this way with a d by d epsilon. Equivalently, what you can do is you can say that uh, S of Q plus delta Q, say, is an integral of half M Q dot plus delta Q dot squared plus a half M omega squared Q plus delta Q squared dt. Now you expand in terms of delta Q being a small number, and uh, you then say that you want the term that's linear in delta Q to be zero. And so you um, have zero is an integral of actually it's a fact of two in this case. So you get uh, m q dot delta q dot uh, plus a half m omega squared q delta q dt, and you want that to be zero, you integrate by parts, and you get the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so P and Q are operators here, right? Right. Okay, so where, at what point does this uh, action become scalar? Not a scalar? Oh, you mean instead of, it's a, instead of a, uh, oh, well, right here. Yeah, that's a good question. Here, H is an operator, and it's P squared operator, Q squared operator, which is coefficients. But when we insert these complete sets of states, they turn p squared into p prime squared and q squared into q prime squared. They then become numbers. Okay, so in this expression, the So right in this expression, they're purely numbers. Okay. And yeah, it's good you ask that because that in a sense is sort of what you were wanting me to say, which is 
one of the remarkable things about path integrals is that you have on the left-hand side something that involves quantum mechanical states and operators. And on the right-hand side, you have a purely, you simply have an integral that involves purely classical functions and purely, the, simply the classical action. Okay. Here it's the Euclidean action, so it's actually the energy. And um, so that's, that's one of the remarkable things about path integrals. And in the case of, say, Q double prime e to the minus i th Q prime, then what you have is that this is an integral e to the i s of Q dq. And so here, you're expressing a quantum mechanical object in terms of an integral involving the classical action. And so that's, that's just intrinsically interesting. And moreover, it's almost completely general. In fact, it could be, some people think that the way to formulate physics is in terms of path integrals rather than in terms of um, the ordinary states and operators. And um, which is true is, is not clear to me. Any other questions? All right. Um, so we've got this Euclidean equation of motion. The solution is, actually in the notes, this C, it's not only classical, but it's, uh, it's E for Euclidean. So I'll write it as E. The solution is A E to the omega T plus B E to the minus omega T. Well, that's pretty obvious because that obviously satisfies this equation. Our arbitrary constants A and B. Um, on the other hand, what we want is we want a solution that goes from Q prime to Q double prime in time beta, or in inverse temperature time beta. And that means that you just solve for A and B. And you find that A is Q double prime e to the minus omega beta minus Q prime e to the minus 2 omega beta, all divided by 1 minus e to the minus 2 omega beta, and the B is Q prime minus A. What's the um, subscript on your little key that you just wrote? What's this? Yeah. E for Euclidean. I was using C, C for classical, E for Euclidean, it's the classical Euclidean solution. So you can have C or E. It's E in the text, and I didn't have my reading glasses on when I was doing this at first, and so I couldn't tell whether it was <coughs> E. Put them on, and D is an E. Turn the camera over here and I'll try to erase this board. Okay, so what's this Euclidean action for this? Um, for this solution, it's, you just, well, what do you do? Well, you take this solution with A that and B that and put it into this expression and you just do the time interval. And then you find that this is one half M omega times A squared e to the 2 omega beta minus 1 minus b squared times e to the minus 2 omega beta minus 1. And now remember, I stressed a lot in the previous, uh, the first week, that when the action was quadratic, we could write the path integral 
as, um, well, first of all, when the action is quadratic, if, the action breaks up into two terms, which actually remarkably just look like this. The linear term goes, well, that would be true whether the action was quadratic or not, but in the quadratic case, not only does the linear term go because this is a solution of the equation of motion, the Euclidean equation of motion, but also because it's quadratic, there are no higher terms, and also because it's quadratic, it turns out that this thing is not some arbitrary functional, but it's the same functional as this one. And that means then that we can write q double prime e to the minus beta h q prime as e to the minus s e of the solution times some loop integral of beta. Well, it will also depend upon m and omega, but it's basically, basically that. And this gives us some L of beta e, and it's just this answer up here, maybe, namely minus a half m omega a squared e to the two omega beta minus one minus b squared to the minus two omega beta minus one. All that's in the exponent. All right, now, you remember one of the things I said was that the reason why this operator is interesting, is there are two reasons. One is that for finite beta, it's the Boltzmann operator that allows you to do quantum statistical mechanics. The second reason is that in the limit beta going to infinity, it, it's a projection operator on the ground state, and you learn about the ground state. Now, in the case of the harmonic oscillator, the ground state is not a great mystery. But in the case of interacting field theories, especially ones that are strongly coupled, the ground state is a total mystery. And so in particular, let's take now the limit beta goes to infinity of this expression. Q double prime e to the minus beta h q prime and see what we get. So this is then the limit beta goes to infinity q double prime n e to the minus beta e n n prime, where I've just inserted a complete set of states here. The identity is the sum of eigenstates of energy, where h n is e sub n n. So this is when the temperature goes to zero? I'm sorry, who's speaking? I, so this is when the temperature goes to zero? This is where? When the temperature goes to zero? Yes. Good point. It's uh, it's a low temperature. It's in the limit of low temperature. So at low temperatures, you project out the vacuum state. Here, let me get it ready. Throwing things is typical ape behavior. And, um, it's one of the reasons I like doing it. So for any, anybody who came in late, I'm going to be following this chapter 16, at least the early parts of chapter 16. The very last sections in chapter 16 are fairly advanced and I don't want to do that until it gets cold. In other words, the winter or the late winter. All right, so, so we were doing that. We're looking at this, um, this approximation here, and now what does this, what will this be? Well, this will be uh, 
effectively e to the minus beta e zero times q double prime the ground state ground state uh, q prime and um, plus higher order terms that are essentially negligible because e one and e two are, are larger than e than e zero. So what we learn then is that e to the minus beta e zero times two double prime zero zero q prime is the limit on the right hand side. Uh, in other words, it's the limit of this as beta goes to infinity. Well, as beta goes to infinity, this term is going to go to zero. This term is going to uh, become large. And, oh, but we also have formulas for A and B. A is e to the minus omega, e to the minus two omega, e to the minus two omega. So this, in the limit of beta goes to infinity, is q double prime e to the minus omega beta. This going to zero, that going to zero. And this one, b, goes, well, just stays as q prime minus a. It, did, maybe it'd be good to turn the thing over here so that, so that this gets on the, on the screen. So when we put those uh, together, what we get is l of beta e to the minus a half m omega and the what we find is just this. So I have a question. So yeah. For A, are you then saying that the factor of two is actually significant in the This two you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Is significant if this is compared to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so what do we learn from this? What well, we're learning from this um, what we learn from this is that Q zero is in fact m omega over pi h bar to the one quarter e to the minus a half m omega squared q squared. Without even solving for L of beta. This thing comes from normalization, namely that one is the integral q zero squared. So in other words, th this is just what I've done now is an illust illustrates how you can learn about the ground state of the theory by looking at these Euclidean path intervals. And it also shows you that you can sometimes get the answer, of the, you, can also, you can sometimes actually get the ground state by using Feynman's trick of um, expanding about the classical solution. In this case, the Euclidean solutions. And um, in, in gauge theories, these Euclidean solutions are called uh, instantons. Yeah? Uh, can you just, how did you make that step from the top line to the second line? Let me toss you the chalkboard first. What? From the top line to the second line. Hmm. Is, that, is that obvious? Not obvious? Well, this doesn't involve q, so zero q prime, it's got to be e to the minus a half m omega squared prime squared, okay, times a factor. What's the factor? The factor you get from integrating the normalization condition, apart from a phase, but in quantum mechanics you never have a phase. Good question. 
had a question. Yeah. When we let B, beta go to infinity, yeah. why do we still have a beta for A? Oh, well, I mean, this is the leading term. But you're right, good, great question. You're right, this actually does go to zero, but look where A occurs. So can we turn the camera around? A occurs up here squared. And so the, it's, it has a minus two omega. That cancels, omega beta, that cancels the e to the two omega beta. On the other hand, in the B squared term, uh, what is B squared? It's Q prime minus A. The Q prime goes away, but again we have an A and it's squared, and again that cancels that. And um, what I'm hesitating about. Well, I assume I did the arithmetic correctly here. I, I have not done the arithmetic for you. I just said that you go from one thing to the other. Um, I must say, just looking at this offhand, I'm not quite sure how the Q prime squared, the A double prime, the A brings in the Q double prime squared in a pretty obvious way. Um, B brings in a Q prime squared. Ah, oh, that's right. There's a Q prime squared. That just multiplies the one here. And um, then the A squared term hits these two terms, it goes to zero. So that's how the Q prime squared comes about. Anyway, it's I encourage you to do the the, 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 to fill in the arithmetic details. By the way, let me just mention something to you that nearly drove me crazy this morning when I was, I sometimes listen to a radio station in Washington, which normally is pretty good, WAMU, Diane Reeves show. Today, her second hour was devoted to a proposition by a Emeritus Professor of Political Science at Queens College in New York he wanted to do away with the requirement of algebra in the United States. It was too hard. Falling into the station, but I knew I would scream. <laughs> okay. Um, any any questions? Other questions? Now, let me get uh, to something called uh, Euclidean correlation functions. Uh, this is this is. Basically, one of the things that one does with path integrals, uh, especially Euclidean ones, but uh, one uses the same technique for the uh, for the case in which you're computing e to the i, e to the minus i, th. All right. So let's ask, what is q of t? It's e to the i th. Q e to the minus i t h. Where I'm thinking of Q the way I did the Q's over here that got erased, namely the Q is just the um, Schrodinger picture operator, this is the Heisenberg picture operator. So this is, you can think of this as Q at time zero if you want. Okay. Now, this is the, um, the way things go normally, but Euclidean time evolution is e to the th q, e to the minus th. So this you can take as a, as a definition. And again, t is really a sort of inverse temperature rather than actual time. 
And now we can define a time-ordered product of two Euclidean uh, operators. And what is it? It's, well, it's just what it says, namely it's time-ordered. So if T1 is greater than T2, Q Euclidean, it's Q Euclidean of T1, Q Euclidean of T2, plus greater of T2 minus T1, Q Euclidean T2. Okay, theta is the heavy side function. Theta of x is, let me see, I have a nice expression for it. It's x plus absolute value of x over 2 absolute value of x. So the function has, this is 0, one side is heavy, the other one is light because it's 0. That's not how it was named. The man's name was actually heavy side. Um, He was one of the leading British mathematicians in the early 20th century. <coughs> All right, so let's. Um, I have a question. Before. Yeah. So the uh, uh, um, for the Euclidean evolution, that's not a unitary operator because right. So that how how could I think of that then in terms of unitary? Well, it's not unitary. It's not I mean, you're absolutely right. Something. It's not unitary, but it's 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 that that's a very good observation. Um, the funny thing is, though, that it's sort of balanced, isn't it? Yeah. Unitary operators are are intrinsically balanced. They preserve inner products. This one is balanced it's, in a kind of different would be way. Actually, unitary. Huh? This doesn't have the i in it. In the same well, way. no, it doesn't. Yeah. If it had the i, then it'd be simply unitary. But this one, you know, you. If H is mainly positive, this sort of expands it, but this shrinks it by the same amount. So it's, it's. I mean, if this were a math class, we we call this pseudo unitary or something. Um, okay, so. So let's let's compute the following. Q sub t e minus t h Euclidean t one Euclidean t two e minus t h Q minus t. All right. So what's that? That's going to be Q sub t, e to, now we're going to substitute for Q e t1, we're just going to use this formula where this is Q of 0, the ordinary Q. So this is e minus t minus t1 h Q e to the minus t1 minus t2 Q e to the minus t plus T two H Q sub minus T. So what do we get? For the time ordered product with the sandwich between E to minus T H what do we get? What do we get if we do the same thing that we've now done several times, namely we T1 
take this integral of length 2t from minus t to plus t, we insert all those complete sets of states, we write this as e to the minus t and then whatever h is, uh, presumably p squared over 2m plus some v of q, and we insert all those time slices of, yeah. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but what, so the um, state vectors that we're using, what, are those like position eigenstates? Like what is the t? Actually, uh, well, let me give a, the guy who moves those things, you, you should get two. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what? Um, yeah, so what, like are those, um, I, like you kind of understand those being position eigenstates or something, but what is the t and the negative t um, subscript indicate? What? Oh, yeah, that's good. Um, that's just an arbitrary eigenstate of the position operator. But and the minus t just means that that it's 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 the one that goes at that end, and the sub t means it's the one that goes on the other end. It's like just two prime controls. Okay, so I mean, it's not like. The states are changing with, or like are they eigenstates of the time dependent Q or the time independent Q? No, all my eigenstates are going to. I mean, we, we, we would insert complete sets of states, and they'd all be of the form Q Q prime is Q prime Q prime. Okay, so the, the time independent Q operator, not the time dependent, not the right, picture. right. This is, in other words, in, in that particular case, we'd say that Q, Q sub minus T was Q sub minus T, Q minus T. Okay. Okay. Good question. All right, well, if you do that, you insert all those complete sets of states. What's the difference? The only difference is instead of e to the minus 2th, you've got these guys. But what do these guys look like? Well, you've got, it's going to give you QE, um, well, this thing, of course, is going to look like, it's going to look, when T1 is greater than T2, it's going to look like this. And in fact, it's going to look this way. So this is the this is the thing that you want to insert the complete sets of states into. And so you'd be you'd be getting e to the my, this part would give sort of an e to the minus integral of let us say the Euclidean Lagrangian dt from minus t to, uh, let us say, t plus t2. And then you'd have a q occurring. So this would be a q, whatever that q state was there. And then you'd have more e to the minus integral from let us say t2 to t1, so this must really be t2. t2 to t1, L dt, and, th and this would then be q t1, this would give us q t2, and then you'd have t to the minus integral L from uh, t1 to t. So it would look like that. And so what you actually get from this is an integral q of t1, q of t2, e to the minus Euclidean action of q. And the way I wrote it in the notes was comma t comma minus t dq. And what this just means is that um, means that you have an integral from minus t to t of this Euclidean Lagrangian, whatever it is, uh, of q and q dot. <coughs> oh. 
Um, and here, in other words, this thing is an integral from minus t to t of a half m q dot squared plus v of q, let us say t prime, t prime, dt prime. And what I should have done first pedagogically, which tell you what this is, namely Well, this is going to be an integral So this is the same as this, except that this one has q of t1 and q of t2 in it All right, so let me go over here now. So that's um, that's uh, what we get for this ratio. And this this is a very this is the simplest example of a uh, of an infinite class of ratios that are really important in physics. And 
so this is the limit t goes to infinity, whatever e0 happens to be. So this gives you the wave function of the ground state of the theory times e to the minus t0 and then the ground state of the theory. Okay, so what, so, so let me do this thing explicitly then. Um, we can imagine taking this limit t goes to infinity, replacing by and then effectively this is so we in a sense insert this here and there and down here and so what do we get? Let's, let's try to do it carefully. In the numerator we get QT zero, e to the minus E zero T. And then we have zero T time order product QE of T one, QE of T two, e to the minus e zero t ground state ground state q sub minus p and as you one of you asked earlier that's um, this is just an eigenstate of q that happens to be labeled by minus t the eigenvalue happens to be labeled by minus t then in the denominator here we have q sub t zero e to the minus uh, e zero t, or if you want, e to the minus two e zero t, zero q sub minus t. And now you see a lot of these things are canceling. What cancels? There are two factors of e to the minus e zero t, two down here. There are these factors and these factors. And so what we're left with is ground state time ordered product of QE of T1, QE of T2, ground state. And what is it equal to? It's equal to this ratio over here. And it's this ratio what? In the limit of T going to infinity. So, let me summarize that over here. Okay, now, uh, I did this for the case of two cubes. You won't be surprised to know 
that if we had a bunch of them, remember this is the grand state of the theory. The, the grand and, and this theory could be rather complicated. And in fact, you know, in quantum mechanics, we can do various problems. We can do the hydrogen atom, we can do the harmonic oscillator. And it almost ends there. I mean, there are not very many problems we can do in quantum mechanics exactly. And so this tells us a formula for the grand state of an arbitrary quantum mechanical theory. It's a single variable, of course, but it's easy to generalize to many variables. It's going to be Q of T1, Q of Tn, <clears throat> so it's a ratio of patterns. Notice there's no time ordering on the right because it wouldn't make any sense because Q of T1 is just a number, Q of T2 is just a number, they commute with each other. But it makes sense over here because these Q's are defined in terms of e to the minus th's on both sides of them. So they don't commute. And now what's important about this is that you can generalize this to all quantum field theory. So you can first of all generalize it to systems of um, many variables, not just one Q, but three Qs for the position of a particle. Or you can go to N Qs and N Ps, and then it's uh, they go from N Ps to uh, a field theory. Right. So let me let me take that step now into field theory. Again, in this con in this Euclidean space context, the, you may wonder why did I do Euclidean space? Well, the mathematics is better behaved because all these things are damped with e to the minus something, whereas in the real time they're e to the i, and so you have to assume that somehow the uh, phase oscillations will uh, make everything meaningful. And in fact, things are meaningful. Uh, yeah. I, I think I'm going to miss something, but should there be a limit as t goes to infinity on the right hand side here? Say these, that again. These uh, equations are a limit as t goes to infinity or up to like the top and bottom ones. Yeah, you're going to minus infinity plus infinity in both of these. Oh, the integral? I, I just, the integral, the integral, integral over time. This SE, this SE of Q. Which I left out is from minus infinity to plus infinity because we took the limit t go to t going to infinity. Okay. It was originally going from minus t to plus t. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Thanks. But let, let me just say. You could have done all this with um, t replaced by it, and it all would have been essentially the same. I, I'm going to repeat much of it for that case. But first, I want to get us to first many variables and then the, the leap to quantum mechanics. I've met a quantum field theory. I think I've mentioned this and Z describes it in his lecture. Roman numeral one, one point, chapter 1.1 1 .1 or 1.2. All right, we're going then first to Q sub I, P sub K, this would be I delta IK and of course QI, QI. 
Pi K is Pi PK zero. So this is a system of n variables. And now what you do is you promote this variable x to a space-time point. A space point, not a space time point, a space point. And so now what we have is q sub x, p sub x prime, is i delta x, x prime, and then these other guys being zero. And the next thing is we say, well, to distinguish this from quantum mechanics, we're going to call this a field. And so this is a field at space-time x. And we call the conjugate variable, which here is p, we call it pi. And now this is going to be delta q of x minus x prime. So this is a delta function. Now, um, I'm, this is the standard way of doing things. And this treatment, by the way, from single variable qp to many qps to field theory <coughs> is the same whether we're doing um, uh, whether we're doing quantum mechanics or quantum field theory. The underlying fields are the same. It's just we're computing different matrix elements. And matrix elements of different operators, either e to the minus ith or e to the minus beta h. And of course we have phi of x, phi of x on equals zero equals pi of x, pi of x. And these are the operators, these are the Schrodinger operators, or equivalently, they're the Heisenberg operators at time zero. And a generic Hamiltonian is an integral a half pi squared of x plus a half <coughs> rad phi of x squared plus a half m squared phi of x squared and then plus some p of phi of x d cubed x. So this is the Hamiltonian that is a space integral of this. Um, This is the normal way this stuff is done. By the way, I should say, uh, as you know, the quantum field theory has lots of infinities. And the question is what to do about these infinities. I don't really know what to do about the infinities. The general attitude today is, well, we just renormalize them. And um, on the other hand, in, in string theory, there's an effort to get rid of them. And the, the way that that's done is to replace point particles by one-dimensional objects. Um, something like that is probably right. Nobody knows if string theory is right. Um, but uh, what, I'm, what I'm sort of getting at here is that when you go from this limit, which is perfectly sensible, of n q's and n p's, to then associating q's with every point in space, that may not be legitimate. Um, in other words, it, 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 it's probably nuts to go from a an integral number of q's to something that's continuously infinitely continuously infinitely many. I mean, to go from, all right, so, I don't know, yeah. So what does the Q subscript X mean? What does Q subscript X mean? Yeah. It means that we, we're, we're going, we're, we're going to have a 
of the quantum variable Q associated, associated with every point in space. This is generalized or quantity. From yeah, instead instead of say n of them, Q one, Q two, up to Q n, yeah. we're going to have Qs, a Q for this point, a Q for that point, a Q for this point, a Q for the other point. And what's a little bit nuts is that you've got two degrees of infinity that you're going through here. One degree of infinity takes you when when you let n go to infinity. And that's a denumerable infinity. And then when you go to the real numbers, you're going to a higher degree of infinity. And um, there's actually something, I'll get to this point, but do you have another question here? Oh, okay, all right. I was, there's something about differential equations that I think is maybe relevant to this, may not be. And it's that, if you do, if you ask yourself, suppose you have a, you study differential equations that are second order, and um, you find a, a set of solutions, and you ask yourself, is this, are the solutions complete? Well, these these eigenfunctions are the eigenfunctions complete. Well, the eigenfunctions, of course, have eigenvalues, so you have some differential operator. Um, what do I call it? I want to call it L, but that's what people often do call it. All right, so L is a second order differential operator. Phi n is <coughs> n of say x. It, 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 in, in other words, this I mean this might be something as simple as uh, a half uh, d2 dx squared. Uh, I'll say plus or minus omega squared. Um, so L might be something like this. This is, this is the case with a simple harmonic oscillator. But in general, you have some arbitrary second order differential operator here, an eigenfunction, eigenvalue. You ask yourself, when are these phi ends complete? Well, the essential answer is they're complete when these eigenvalues go to infinity. In other words, that you have the lowest, uh, order them say so, L1 is the lowest, or L0 is the lowest, you have L1, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. As n goes to infinity, if the lambdas go to infinity, then the eigenfunctions are complete. And what does it mean that they're complete? Well, what it means that they're complete is that phi, well, these are typically real, actually. that with suitable normalization, this is delta of x minus y. So you see there's a certain, um, when you put in a delta function, when you're starting to get serious about saying you've got a delta function in the theory, that means, in other words, you've got something like this, your, eigen, your eigenvalues are going to infinity and this may be, this may be the source of the infinities of quantum field theory, but don't, don't, don't uh, accept that as an actual true statement. It's, it's just that this, I have the feeling that there's some relation between the two, and that maybe this is a mistake, but this is what is done in all ordinary quantum field. Is there a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, so what's the, in the general like um, field Hamiltonian that you wrote out, um, what's the interpretation of each of those terms there? It's just I'm trying to... You mean, what, 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 where am I? These terms here? Yeah. 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 All right, you're, 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 you're... All right, this is a mass term. Okay. The mass of the particle. Um, these are the self-interactions. Okay. Now, the fact is that this is the simplest field theory that you can write down. And if you set p equal to zero, you can actually solve it exactly. So this is the, the this is the model field theory that everybody talks about in elementary quantum field theory. However, as you know, um, in the standard model of particle physics, this isn't really how things go. There isn't any field like this. 
The closest to it, in fact, the only scale of field that's been discovered so far is this, I'll get to you, say, is this uh, pigs like object that was found at the LHC in the past year or so. That seems to be a scale of particle. It may be the Higgs. But even the Higgs boson doesn't have a mass term like this. It's, it has a mass term that's similar to this, but it's not really. Um, and moreover, the only, in the standard model, the only spin zero field is the Higgs field. All the other fields, the quarks and the leptons, they have spin one half. The photon is spin one, the gluons are spin one, the W and Z are spin one, the graviton is spin two. So in a certain sense, this is the wrong way to look at quantum field theory. But it's the simplest way to look at quantum field theory. All right, so somebody had a question over here. Uh, uh, I was just going to say that there's no less than okay. You're, you're saying that there aren't any scalar particles, but I would say yeah, that it's both on the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, yeah, but that's, that's as, a, as far as we know, the only, the only one at this point. On the other hand, um, if supersymmetry is right, you've got zillions of them. Is supersymmetry right? I don't know. I think it would be marvelous if, if supersymmetry were found uh, to be irrelevant at present energies. That would mean that many layers of theoretical physics would right down the toilet. <laughs> and um, that would mean that we all have to start thinking afresh. That would be great. Um, whether it's a right or not. All right, I think we're done. <laughs>